Israeli coalition government about to topple? Is Netanyahu about to become prime minister again? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on The Line of Fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us on this Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. This is Michael Brown. Any Jewish-related question you have of any kind, any question relating to the Messiahship of Yeshua, any question you have about Jewish tradition, Hebrew language, specific verses in the Hebrew Bible, give me a call. Modern Israeli government, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. Before we get into our first topic of the day, namely, the Israeli government is the coalition government about to collapse. Will Prime Minister Netanyahu rise back to power as prime minister? If, if that's a possibility, what are the paths to get in that? Before doing that, I was just looking for an update on the news, if there was anything new about the challenge to the coalition government, and was saddened to see that there's been another apparent terrorist attack, this time on Dizengoff Street in Tel Aviv, very busy, prominent street in the heart of the city. And uh, at present, six people wounded, at least one of them critically <laughs> And the gunman, at least one person involved, the gunman has not been caught yet, not been apprehended. Uh, people have been told to stay indoors in the city. So it's, uh, it, it's an intense time in Israel right now. Uh, 11 people have died and others have been wounded in recent terrorist attacks. And it's, it's different than at times in the past, say with the declared intifada. And yeah, there were terrorist attacks coming from all different directions but there was more of a concerted effort by the terrorists, more of a concerted call, and it might have been easier for Israel to fight against that, as horrible as those seasons were, and many thousands of Israelis died. But here, it seems to be more random in its uprising and nature, and it's just a time again to pray for the people of Israel and for God's purposes and for God's protection and for all within the land to turn their hearts to look to the one and only one who can help, namely God himself. All right, 866-34-TRUTH. Let me try to explain again the complexities of the Israeli government and what has recently happened this week that has threatened the very fragile coalition that currently exists. So I'm going to go through some things from... March of 2021. Uh, as always, our focus is on everyone listening by radio or podcast, so we're making things as clear as we can by audio. But for those watching on YouTube or Facebook, I'm, I'm putting something up. It's just the Wikipedia page listing what happened in the uh, elections in March 2021. So you've got, I'm going to list all the parties that, that won enough votes to at least get four seats in the Knesset. That's the minimum threshold, right? You have to get enough uh, uh, votes to get four seats, and there are 120 seats total in the Israeli Knesset, the parliament. So to have a majority government, you need to have 61 seats out of the, the 120. So let's say it was Republicans versus Democrats, and Republicans got 62 seats, and Democrats got 58 seats, or vice versa, so easy majority. Let's say it's Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and the Republicans get 59 seats and the Democrats get 58 seats and the Independents get three. Well, who can, whoever can make a deal with the Independents and govern together, now you've got a majority government. Well, here's the, the total number of parties that won seats in the Israeli elections the last months. Are you ready? Likud, Yeshatid, Shas, Blue and White, Yamina, Labor, UTJ, Israel Baitenu, uh, Religious Zionist, Joint List, New Hope, Meretz, Ra'am. 13 parties, one seats. Some of them ultra-Orthodox like United Torah Judaism, UTJ, or Shas. Uh, some of them uh, Joint List or Arab. Uh, so you, you've got these, the, or, or Ra'am. You've got these different groups, all right? And they're they're all competing for seats. Now, the number one party, the strongest, was Netanyahu's Likud. They got 30 seats. 
But because Netanyahu has been so controversial, because he has certain enemies, that there were people who were not going to work with him or form a coalition with him, and others were saying he was moving too far to the right. And therefore, because of that, uh, we, we were, uh, they, they weren't going to form a coalition government with him. So how in the world do you make this work? Now, you say, who's the current prime minister? The current prime minister is Naftali Bennett. He's of the Yamina party. The Yamina party only got seven seats. How in the world did he end up becoming prime minister? Now, it's, it's temporary. He'd have it for two years. And then you're, you're Lapid from another party having it for two years. So I'm going to leave that graphic up for those that are watching. And the, the, the 36th government of Israel, after four straight elections without a clear, decisive victory for one party that was easily able to form a coalition. Look at this. The agreement was signed between Yesha Tid, Blue and White, Yamina, Labor Party, Israel Batan, and New Hope Merits, and the United Arab List. The United Arab List, with just a few, uh, just, just a few seats, right, w- was able to be a major, major player here. All right, so six seats. And, and then, then you have Yamina, with only seven seats, ends up with one of the, the two prime ministers. It's a 61 seat coalition they got. The first option, the first option was for Netanyahu's Likud to form a majority, because there that's how it works. Your party got the most votes. Okay, now go ahead and form a majority government. He couldn't get 31 others. He couldn't get 31 other seats. He he had the religious right with him and others, but he couldn't form a coalition government. So this very, very fragile group comes together. And if somebody says, I, I don't like the way you're governing, I'm out of here, boom, the whole thing collapses. So what happened this past week is Idit Silman, who is part of the Yamina party, has officially dropped her affiliation there, meaning it is no longer 61 to 59. That it is now 60 to 60. And for Netanyahu, in his mind, this is a defection towards him. What were her specific comments? It was not about Netanyahu that she was speaking. Rather, she and others felt that that Bennett is too centrist, that in order to bring this coalition together, he has come more to the center, whereas Yamina, what it means in Hebrew is is to the right. It is a right-wing party. It is not radical right-wing, but it is a right-wing party. So for, and Naftali Bennett himself is an Orthodox Jew, not ultra-Orthodox, but Orthodox. So he's been criticized, for example, speaking uh, with President Biden, speaking in public, referencing the West Bank. You don't talk about the West Bank. That is a leftist talking point or a Western talking point or an anti-Israeli talking point. If you're an Israeli conservative, you talk about Judea, Samaria. That's what it is, the biblical territories of Judea and Samaria. Others call it the West Bank. No, it's part of biblical Israel. So things like that, uh, have gotten her to step away and said his values no longer reflect the values of Yamina. And talk is that others in the party will also defect. And if they do, if they join with, with Likud, theoretically, or just stood outside and were available to, to be brokered by others, then the whole government would come down immediately. So what are the potential paths forward? Well, one would be back to Likud, Back to Netanyahu, who is now also using the terrorist attacks as part of his political ammunition to say, look, when I was prime minister, terrorism was the lowest it's been. we, We had a firm hand and the terrorists recognized it, but the current government is weak and that's why they're attacking the way they are. Now, obviously, those are very strong claims. Could anyone stop this type of terror? That's that's debatable. And what if Netanyahu gets back in power and the terrorism continues like this or is even worse? Nonetheless, there were many things very positive with his government and others not. And of course, he's right in the middle of major court cases where he's been indicted for corruption. And depending where you are in the political spectrum, you either think he's being attacked unfairly or you think he's finally getting justice. In any case, he remains a very controversial figure. In that respect, not tremendously different than Donald Trump in America in terms of being controversial and really loved and really hated. And in fact, married three times for the record, if you want another parallel there. 
in any case, it is possible, it'd be difficult, but it is possible that with this shift that Netanyahu could get enough votes. So, so there's a vote of no confidence in the current government. The, the majority is no longer there. It's possible that he could put together a coalition that would get him back in power. Would it be for the good or not? I don't know. There's a lot I like about Netanyahu. There are concerns I have in terms of how far right the government was going. And certainly one of the biggest concerns as a Messianic Jew is that for him to get back in power, he has to have the ultra-Orthodox parties with him. And the ultra-Orthodox parties will use their power in ways that will hurt Messianic Jews and in certain ways not be in the best interest of the whole nation. So there's that dynamic. As much as I've appreciated Netanyahu in so many other ways and has been a great statesman for Israel and a strong leader in many ways. The other alternative would be if a coalition government cannot be formed that you have yet another wave of elections. Just think of the last elections in America, how divisive that was to the country, how wearying that was to the country. Is Israel gonna go through this yet again? Is Israel gonna to have to be subject to this yet again? And then how effective can a government be in the midst of a time like this, when you're going through, you, you, you don't have a clear mandate, you don't have a clear majority to make decisions and everything's kind of paralyzed. Does this want to go through that again? But that's the other option. And I'm quite sure Netanyahu being the seasoned politician that he is and, and being very ambitious to lead the nation once again, and with his party getting so many more seats than the closest competitors, that he's gonna push forward however he can and see this as, as a mandate to move forward. So that's what's happening right now. You say, how should we pray? The way I often pray for situations in Israel, because it doesn't just affect Israel, it affects the surrounding Arab and Muslim nations. It affects the world in many ways. Lord, your will be done in Israel. Your, will, your purposes come to pass with the government because God knows which way is best. And God cares for every human being in the land, for Israelis, for Palestinians, for Muslims, for Jews, for atheists, for his own followers. He cares for every person in the land. Lord, your best, your will, bring it to pass. You move the pieces on the chessboard the way you see fit to accomplish your purposes. That's my prayer. We'll come back and go straight to the phones, 866-348-7884. Dr. Mark Stengler is a personal friend. He has been voted Doctor of the Decade, called America's Doctor. He loves Jesus, and his health supplements are second to none. I've used them for years. He's now partnering with our ministry. When you go to vitaminmission.com, vitaminmission.com, you'll see a special code. You get a 10% discount on all your orders, and 10% of the order will be donated to our ministry. The place to go is vitaminmission.com. We live in an on-demand world, time, weather, meals, and content. That's why the Truth Network has the Truth Podcast Network, some of your favorite Truth Network programs, plus some that are podcast only. Rich content that is rich in the word. The Truth Network's Lantern Rescue Podcast sheds light on the horror of human trafficking. Listen to the knit and grit it takes to make these international rescue operations possible. With God's help, the USA-based Lantern Rescue team travels the world, and they have so many stories to share. The Lantern Rescue Podcast at truthnetwork.com. Adopt U.S. Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting A Teenager Learning the Lingo Today I'm going to help parents translate teen slang. Now, when a teen says something is on fleek, it's exactly like saying, that's rad. It simply means that something is awesome or cool. Another one is totes. It's exactly like saying, totally, just shorter. As in, I totes love going to the mall with Becca. Another word you might hear is jelly. Jelly is a shorter, better way to say jealous. As in, Chloe, I am like so jelly of your unicorn phone case. You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will think you're, um, rad just the same. To learn more, visit AdoptUSKids.org. 
A public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt U.S. Kids, and the Ad Council. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. That music is your reminder. 866-348-7884. Uh, just looking at a report that that speaks of now two people dead in the terrorist attack. I'm not sure if that report came in first, saying two dead, and then it's afterwards just wounded, or if among the wounded, two have died. I'll try to get that sorted out for you. Oh, this is not Thursday Jewish Thursday related, but it is big news that just Katanji Brown Jackson has been confirmed by the Senate as the next Supreme Court justice who will serve. So my prayer for Judge Jackson is that she will rule righteously in God's sight and that she will, by rule, I mean make rulings, right, as judges do, and that she'll be a godly influence, a righteous influence on the court. Someone questioned me on Twitter, well, is that a right way to pray? Is it biblical? And God's not gonna make people do certain things. Of course, it's the right way to pray. Of course, it's the right way to pray. From what I can tell, I disagree with her judicial philosophy, just like those on the left disagree with the judicial philosophy of, of Justice Amy Coney Barrett. But once the person's confirmed, right? So I, I'm, I'm constitutional, originalist, conservative in my viewpoint of where the court should land on things versus activist or, quote, living constitution. But once someone's in, then I'm praying for God's best. I'm praying for God to help that person to do the right thing. How can we not pray that? In any case... Just wanted to share that. All right, 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to the phones. We'll start with Skip in Utah. Welcome to the line of fire. All right, tell you what, whatever is up with that connection, I can't hear Skip. But Skip, your question, as I see it on my board here, why do you only hear about terrorist attacks from me, not the media? You know, I I just, I I saw your question and during the break, I was just looking at Fox News. I was looking at CNN online. uh, And of course, a lot of stories about the confirmation of Justice Jackson and the major news that is, and other news of different kind and Tiger Woods uh, playing in the Masters and getting off to a a good start, et cetera. Um, I I didn't see any reports here. Could it be because it's six people wounded, nobody killed, it's not as big news? Uh, it's a very, very fair question. I mean, if, here, if, if, if I just go to any major Jewish website, uh, I, I know what's going to come up. You know, if I go to Israeli websites, uh, Haaretz, yeah, two killed. What a shame. Two killed, eight wounded, four in, in a serious condition. Police now suspect attack carried out by a single gunman. I had read earlier, they thought it might be two, but best they can tell, one fourth terror attack in two weeks. Uh, You'll see it all over the Jewish news as to why you're not seeing it reported more widely. The saddest reason would be because terror attacks in Israel are nothing new. (gasps) No big deal. You know, it's just like in cities in America where there's constant, constant shootings. It's just not the news as much as it should be. And how many terror attacks take place on a regular basis in a country like Nigeria, where Muslim radicals are attacking Christians and we, we never hear about it in America? And I've asked that question, why don't those black lives matter? You know, we, we absolutely affirm the, the value and importance of every black life in America, but how about every black life period? You know, is it is the color of the skin and because they're getting slaughtered in Nigeria, it doesn't matter to us as much? You wonder, you know, you hear about a terrorist attack, say, in Brussels at an airport. It's a terrible thing. And it's, you know, many, many people killed or attacked. And it, it gets world headlines. But some of these other things, no headlines at all. It does make you wonder. Hey, thank you for the call. Uh, let's go and, and, and may God's grace be, be with the, the families of the victims and those that are seriously hurt. And may God turn the tide within the land. 
866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to John in Virginia. Welcome to the line of fire. Yes, thank you, Dr. Brown. You're welcome. Yeah, my question is, what is a Jew? A, a definition. I've been studying religion more seriously and, and listening to your program. And, there's, and maybe you've answered this in the past, I apologize, but between, you know, religion, race, ethnicity, you know, it, what exactly is a definition? Yes, it's, uh, I've answered it many times, but the question comes up all the time, and it's very relevant. So uh, first let me explain why it's a confusing question for those that don't follow. If someone says, I'm a Christian, that is simply having to do with their religious faith. If someone says, I'm Hispanic, that is explicitly having to do with their ethnicity. If someone says, I'm black, that has to do with their race. And those are three separate categories, right? When you say, I'm a Jew, that could mean you are a practitioner of Judaism, or it could mean that you have descended ethnically from the Jewish people. So you can have an atheist Jew uh, and you could have a Jew who's a Buddhist, right? So how does it, how does it actually work? And there's even a debate uh, right within the Israeli government in terms of the definition of a Jew. In, in other words, any Jew has the right of return to Israel. So if, if you're a Jewish person, then you can emigrate to Israel and become a citizen there. What about someone like me, a Messianic Jew, a Jewish follower of Jesus? Have I converted to another religion, Christianity in their eyes, and therefore I'm no longer Jewish? Or is it impossible to stop being Jewish like it's impossible to stop being Hispanic or stop being white or stop being black? So that's the debate. But to define a Jew historically, it would have been a descendant of the the people of Israel. You might have been a godly descendant, a, a worshiper of the one true God of Israel, Or you might have been ungodly. You might have worshipped other gods, but you were still an Israelite. And then from there, ultimately, as as everything comes through through Judah and the the kingdom of Judah and the the province of Judea, so you would have been a, a Judean, a Jew. That's where we get it from. So to this day, to say someone is a Jew could be a broad ethnic statement. They are descendant from the Jewish people. Or it could be an expression of their religious faith. So here's how you get white Jews, black Jews, Asian Jews, Hispanic Jews, etc. Here's how you get Jews of all colors. People convert to Judaism. And when they convert to Judaism, they become part of the Jewish people. And therefore, the Jewish people will have many different backgrounds of you know, skin color and ethnicity, but then once you are part of the Jewish people, that becomes a larger designation as well. So you can be a physical descendant, like your parents were Jewish, they were non-religious Jews, you're a non-religious Jew, you're still a Jew. That's more of an ethnic descent. Or it could be that your family converted to Judaism, became followers of the God of Israel, and now your kids will be considered Jews even though there was no historic connection. So it's, it's a bit more complicated, but once you understand it, then it makes sense. Yeah, it's hard to make sense of, I guess. Uh, okay, so, I mean, to, is it, um, well, I don't know. I guess, uh, would, it, would it be better to distinguish between Israelites and, and, and Jews, or no. are there really hardly no. any racial Jews anymore? Because... No, no, there, there are yeah, plenty I mean, that, are, that have right. descent back. There are millions of Jews living in Israel that have Middle Eastern descent that, that are not uh, converts into Judaism, like my family line would have been as a Caucasian uh, at, some, at some stretch in time, or inter, intermarriage would be the other thing, you know, intermarriage with conversion to Judaism. No, so there, there are plenty of, of Jews, the, a, a very good number especially those who are not Ashkenazi, who would be able to say, yeah, we, we trace ourselves back to the people of Israel and the Middle East and the Jewish people, etc." cetera. Uh, but by the time you have the New Testament, you, you've, things have already spread. You've already had many people convert to Judaism and join from other nations. 
and God calls the people Jews there, right? They're, they're referred to as Jews, Jewish people. So again, it's, it's not confusing once you understand that there is the ethnic descent, and as long as that's preserved, then you're a Jew. Or you could convert to Judaism from another ethnicity, and now you're part of the larger Jewish people. So those are the categories. But the simple thing is, once a Jew, always a Jew, right? So you're born a Jew, you die a Jew. When, when I was about to get baptized in, in February of 1972, so I was saved for a number of weeks then and born again, follower of Yeshua, and my dad was concerned, you know, baptism, that's another step. And uh, the old rabbi who had been the previous rabbi of the synagogue there, he said, you know what'll happen to your son after February 4th? I think that was in February 4th, 72. He goes, he'll be a baptized Jew. And he's still a Jew. So obviously the guy, the, the old rabbi didn't agree with, with my religious choices, but he's telling my dad, hey, your son's still a Jew. Don't worry about that. Hey, thank you very much for the call. Much appreciated. Uh, all right, I just got a minute before the break. Clay, you're next. Yes, and oh, Michael, love your question about ancient Israelites, the blacks. We'll, we'll get to your calls on the other side of the break. But remember Esther 414, where Mordecai, the Jew, challenges his cousin Esther, his younger cousin Esther. Hey, you got to risk your life to save your people now. If you don't speak, help will come from another place. But who knows, maybe God put you in the kingdom doesn't say God that God's not mentioned explicitly in Esther. You've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. April 14th, Esther 414. That's why April 14th, coming soon, National Not Ashamed of Jesus Day. What are you going to do on that day? Go to notashamedofjesus.org. Notashamedofjesus.org. Let's help spread the word. We'll be right back. When you listen to One on One with Pastor Jonathan Falwell from the historic Thomas Road Baptist Church, you'll be blessed with solid inspiration and encouragement. God has a perfect plan for you. God wants you to live your destiny and to live it victoriously. Many thanks to our friends at the Standing for Freedom Center at Liberty University who bring Pastor Jonathan to us daily. The Standing for Freedom Center for life, liberty, and truth. One on One with Pastor Jonathan Falwell. It will challenge you to grow in Christ and share Jesus and his love with others. The Truth Network. What would happen this Sunday if Jesus Christ showed up at your church? True Commentary with Stu Epperson, author of the book, Last Words of Jesus. This is exactly what happened in Luke chapter 19, Mark 11, Matthew 21, and even in John chapter 2. Jesus Christ came in and he cleansed the temple. The Lord of the Sabbath, the Son of God, came into his father's house and he was upset. And he saw all the merchandising. What they had done, in the words of Jesus, is they had turned his father's house into a den of thieves. Jesus wasn't at home there because it wasn't about him or his father. Is your church Christocentric? That means filled with Jesus. Is he the hero at your church? Is his word being taught? If he came to your church today, would he be uncomfortable? Would he even recognize it? Or would he be at home? Something to think about. True Commentary with Stu Epperson, author of the book, Last Words of Jesus. Available now in bookstores. Learn more at lastwordsofjesus.com. United States Deputy Sheriff's Association is a national nonprofit and America's largest non-governmental provider of services to law enforcement. USDSA assists city, county, state, and federal law enforcement agencies through our many varied programs, including free safety equipment donations, free officer survival training, cash donations, and condolence letters to the family of law enforcement officers who perish in the line of duty. USDSA also offers college scholarships for the dependent children of law enforcement along with the Citizen Awareness Program and thank you cards to law enforcement. These are just some of the ways United States Deputy Sheriff's Association assists America's law enforcement and the citizens they serve. For more information about United States Deputy Sheriff's Association or to see how you can help, visit www.usdeputy.org. United States Deputy Sheriff's Association, taking training to the next level because lives are on the line. Many medicines used to treat colds and flu contain acetaminophen 
a pain reliever and fever reducer found in hundreds of over-the-counter and prescription medicines. But taking too much or more than one medication containing acetaminophen per day can damage your liver. So always read the label and don't take acetaminophen if you drink three or more alcoholic drinks every day. To learn more, visit fda.gov slash OTC pain info. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Food and Drug Administration. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on The Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends. For Me, His grace and His face shine upon you. Me, the Lord. Oh, yeah. When I, when I hear those words, I get stirred that music moves me. Uh, by the way, my team always reminds me on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday that, that we have our extra Jewish music. Most of the time I remember, sometimes like today, I'm ready to jump in early. But once I hear it, I just want to kind of sit back and take it in. Welcome to the broadcast, 866-34-TRUTH. Any Jewish-related questions, we're opening the phones momentarily. Okay, so, so hearing those words sung and the words of the priestly blessing reminds me of a, a, a tweet that I sent out last night. Now, to be candid, because, I, because I've written a lot over the years, many thousands and thousands of pages, I don't remember everything I've ever written in terms of quoting others or citations of others and things like that. When, when someone's reading from a book I wrote 30 years ago, I'm, I'm pretty much knowing what comes next and where it stops and where it starts and I've had people quote me, it's like, oh, no, I had a semicolon there, not a comma. I mean, I, I remember that kind of stuff much better, right? Someone will quote from one of my books and say, Dr. Brown said this. It's like, no, I didn't say that. I quoted someone who said that in the book. You missed that. So, ah, but when I'm quoting other scholars and their information, there's tons of stuff that, I, that I, I research, I annotate, and then I forget, right? Or it's stored somewhere else in my brain. So I was reviewing an article that I'd written an academic article in the New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis on the Hebrew root, Barach, Levarech, to bless, etc. And there was a note uh, from, from a, a top Old Testament scholar, David Noel Friedman, about the priestly blessing. And it, it, was, it was really interesting. So that's number six, may the Lord bless you and keep you, right? And yeah, l- look at this. And I'd, I'd forgotten this. Okay, so... It builds to a crescendo. So the, the first clause, Yivarechecha Adonai V'yishmarecha. So it's three words in Hebrew. Then the next, Ya'er Adonai Panavelecha V'chunecha. That next is five words. And then the last, Yisa Adonai, uh, uh, may the Lord lift his face upon you, V'yasem Lecha Shalom, and grant you peace. The last is seven words. And the accented syllables are three, five, and seven. And then the total number of consonants, 15, 20, 25. Just one of these beautiful things in terms of carefully crafted in the Hebrew, building to a crescendo. All right, 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Clay in Virginia. Welcome to the line of fire. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Is the uh, T-O-B a translation or a Paraphrase, sir. Oh, it's a translation. Absolutely, it's a translation. The Tree of Life version is a translation. Yes, uh, what would cause you to wonder about that, sir? I, I was just um, I was just listening uh, to the show yesterday, and that came into my mind. And uh, I was just curious. Uh, what, another quick question. Do you know of any plan to put it on audio, um, yeah, in the, audio format. TLV, uh, I don't know. I, I didn't know it wasn't on audio, actually. Um, I'm not sure if you go to you version, if there is an audio version or not. So check that out. Check out the the you version of the Bible, uh, the, the app, which has been distributed by the multiplied millions that makes all these translations available for free. And then you can just download them on your cell phone or tablet and, and have full access to them. But many of them are available in audio. 
So I don't know if you can get it as an Audible book. You know, go to audible.com. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But I think, I think it may have been released in audio on you version. So I'd have to check that, but I, I'm not. No, it's not. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for checking, sir. We've got a great team here as I'm broadcasting from CFNI in Dallas. So in any case, uh, I, don't, I don't know if there are plans to do it. So the TLV is distinct in, for example, rendering Jesus with Yeshua and rendering Mary with Miriam. Those are not paraphrases. Those are just saying this is the way it would have been uh, originally, right? That, that Yeshua was known as Yeshua, not Jesus, and that his mother was Miriam, not Mary. Or it may reference the Holy Spirit, and instead of having Holy Spirit, it'll say Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew, those kinds of things. But that's not a paraphrase. That's, that's a translation with a very specific purpose. But thank you for asking. Uh, much appreciated. All right. 866-34-TRUTH. Let us go to Michael in Washington. Welcome to the line of fire. Hello. Yes. Hello, Michael. Hello. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I recently, uh, a friend of mine said that they've seen an article by the Obadiah Alliance that they made a ruling on the Igbos saying that they were descendant from the ancient Israelites. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see how that's possible. Um, I'm not trying to make this a, a, a race thing, but I don't see how it's possible when um, the, you know, they don't, uh, the ancient Israelites were, uh, looked European, correct? No, they didn't look European. Certainly not European. They look Middle Eastern. Uh -huh. If If you look at, you know, an Egyptian today or an Iraqi today, they'd be darker skinned, more brown skinned. Uh, we do have a statement from the early second century, or excuse me, early third century in the Mishnah, going back to, to a bit earlier time. And it mentions, it contrasts the Germans and then the Ethiopians, so Caucasians, and then, and then uh, Africans, contrast that with the, the Jews, the, the Israelites, who would have been like boxwood in color. So they, they would have been, you know, brown-skinned people or light brown-skinned people. But how is it that I'm a Jew and I can claim descent from Israel and I'm Caucasian? Uh, how, how is it the Lemba tribe in, in, in Zimbabwe can have verified descent from Israel and they're black? Uh, the answer yeah. is intermarriage. It's very simple. Is the Jewish people spread around the world and people converted to Judaism and intermarried and they stayed long enough in a place, then after a while, Jews in China looked Chinese, Jews in India looked Indian, Jews in Africa looked African, Jews in Europe looked European. That's how it happened. Intermarriage in. So let's, let's remember this, Michael. If we intermarry out, right? In other words, you're a Jewish person, you marry someone that's practicing another faith, and you leave Judaism, then within a generation or two, there's going to be no consciousness of Jewish descent anymore. In other words, your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren will be lost to the people of Israel. But if you intermarry in, you're a Gentile, you convert to Judaism, and you join the Jewish people, now the kids you have, they'll look a little different, but the kids you have will, will now be part of the Jewish people. So... You know, we know from Scripture that there are specific references to Ethiopians or others of dark skin that, that would seem to be different from the people of Israel as a whole. But the, the people of Israel were, were in Egypt and pretty much indistinguishable in many ways outwardly from the Egyptians as far as brown-skinned people. And, of course, you had many black-skinned people in Egypt as well. So that's how you can have different groups in Africa or India or other parts of the world that get discovered. And yeah, there, there is DNA that connects them back to Israel. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, so what made you think that the Israelites look European? Where did you get that from? Um, that's just what's been in front of me my whole life. Uh, yeah. Jesus, European. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, that's the wrong image. Je Jesus as a, as a long-haired white-skinned, blue-eyed uh, European. Those are the images. And, and then you even have religious art 
where the Jews are these evil looking people, the, the rabbis and things, they're these hook nose, almost demon looking people. Bernard Starr, a psychologist, was at Brooklyn College for years, and then came to some of my debates with Rabbi Shmuley and was impacted by those, has written about that publicly. Uh, he's, he's published articles and, and, and books, and he's, he's given examples with Renaissance art and this European Christianized Jesus and then the Jews are these demonized looking people, whereas they, they were all Middle Eastern. Hey, Michael, thank you very much for calling in. I appreciate it. Uh, and, and by the way, we all tend to project a Jesus in our own image. If you look at religious iconography and church history, you'll see in China that Jesus looks Chinese and, and different parts of the world is just projected a certain way. I remember going into a African-American church in Brooklyn in the 70s. And to my surprise, the, there was a mural on the wall and, and Jesus and all the disciples were black. And I, that was surprising to me because I'd always seen them as Caucasian. You know I mean? That's just, I hadn't even thought it through. I hadn't even thought of what someone in the Middle East would have looked like at that time, et cetera. And I remember my friend, he wasn't arguing that Jesus was black. He said, hey, but when you, when you open up a yearbook, you know, your, your college yearbook, a high school yearbook, who's the first person you look for yourself? He says, so we want people to see themselves when they walk in. Uh, Billy Graham once said to, to a mixed crowd, uh, a, a lot of blacks there, he said, hey, he was lighter than you and darker than me. Uh, but in any case, he was absolutely not European, absolutely not Caucasian, for sure. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Michael in Pennsylvania. Welcome to the line of fire. Hello, Dr. Brown. How are you? Hope you're doing wonderful this evening. Yes, thank you. Um, I had a question, but before I get to that, I just would like to ask you in your own personal time to just keep my mom up in prayer, Millie, as she's recovering in the ICU from COVID pneumonia. Oh, how, how, uh, long was, but, how long has she been in the hospital, Michael? Uh, she has been in there since December 31st. Okay, that's a long haul. All right, great grace to her and, and prayer warriors out there. Let's, let's lift her up. Yes, sir. Okay, so as to your question. So my question is, and I'm sorry if it's a bit too broad, but my question is, what did the Jews during the time of Jesus, so not the early church, in other words, like the Pharisees, not mm -hmm. so much the scribes, because we know they didn't believe in a resurrection or angels, but what did the Jews believe in the time of Jesus about the millennial kingdom, or about, as we would call it, the kingdom, rather? Right, so... so it's a great question. It's not too general at all. I'll, I'll answer it on the other side of the break. Have you visited realmessiah.com? Have you checked out the amazing free Jewish resources waiting for you there? Realmessiah.com. Spread the word. We'll be right back. Hey friends, this is Dr. Michael Brown. You know, we've been on the air 13 years daily, five days a week. We've never worked with a sponsor until now. Meet Dr. Mark Stengler, my personal friend, a lover of Jesus, voted doctor of the decade, and his health supplements are second to none. When you go to vitaminmission.com, you'll see a special code to put in. You get 10% off your orders, and a donation is made to our ministry with each order. Vitaminmission.com. As the world faces the challenges of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Lions recognize that kindness matters now more than ever. And Lions and Leos are finding ways to continue to serve our communities, including ordering food delivery for healthcare workers, holding story time for children online, and providing surgical masks to medical professionals and first responders. Empowering us to do more Lions Club's International Foundation has provided nearly $2.5 million in grant funding for COVID-19 relief. And that support continues to grow. For more than 100 years, in times of need, Lions always find a way to help those around them. And after we emerge from this, we will be stronger than ever. Visit lionsclubs.org to learn more. 
We live in an on-demand world. Time, weather, meals, and content. That's why the Truth Network has the Truth Podcast Network. Some of your favorite Truth Network programs, plus some that are podcast only. Rich content that is rich in the word. Truth Talk with Stu Epperson Jr. Podcast. Stu is tall, Stu is funny, and Stu is in love with the Lord. Truth Talk digs deep into the word of God every time with humor, friends, heart, and soul. Listen, Truth Talk. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on The Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, friends, to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you. Let me go straight back to the phone. So, Michael, in Pennsylvania, what did the Pharisees believe about the coming kingdom, what we would refer to as the millennial kingdom. We can't say precisely what they believed in the first century for a couple of reasons. We do have some documents, apocryphal, pseudepigraphical documents from right before the time of Jesus and immediately after the time of Jesus that may have had Pharisaic authorship and then we have the, the teachings of the Pharisees as transmitted by the later rabbis, and these are now developed over a period of centuries. So how much went back to the first century is debated among Jewish scholars. As best as we can tell, though, there was an, an expectation based on the clear words of the Hebrew prophets that there would be a messianic king who would set up his kingdom on the earth. So it was an earthly kingdom, not a heavenly kingdom. So again, in harmony with what we refer to as the millennium, that he would destroy the enemies of Israel and that he would set up a rule of peace on the earth where the whole world would come into the knowledge of God or those that were not destroyed in God's judgment. Some broad strokes like that would have been widely held to. But the idea that there was one universal belief that's been held to by Jewish people through the ages, which is not what you're saying, that would be a, a later rabbinic reconstruction of past history. The Messiah becoming even more of a great teacher, kind of in the image of the rabbis. A lot of that would be kind of retrojecting rabbinic views back on scripture. But as best as we can tell, the Messiah of the, that the Pharisees would have been looking to and therefore the messianic kingdom would have been one where the enemies of Israel are defeated, where Israel, the exiles return. And remember, the temple was still standing at that point, right? So exiles return that were still scattered around the world and the Messiah ruling out of Jerusalem with an iron hand. Some things like that may have been widely viewed and as to a view that there was a thousand year kingdom that was certainly taught in certain Jewish circles, we just can't say it was universal. Even if there was a very strong pharisaical view of this, we just can't say for sure what it was in the first century. But I think these broad strokes are fairly safe. Certainly, even if there were some aspects of messianic suffering that were taught in some Jewish circles, and that remains a debate until this day, the idea that there was an expectation of a crucified Messiah who would rise from the dead, Certainly people didn't see that coming. After it happened, Yeshua could say, hey, look, it's written. This is all written about me. And then eyes were opened to see it. Thanks for your question. And may God's healing grace be with your mom. All right, 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Vicki in North Carolina. Welcome to the line of fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, Vicki. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, and thanks for all the answers that you have given the people. I, I just love gaining the knowledge and everything. I really enjoy the program. Well, thank you. Um, well, what what I was wanting to ask, I met a uh, an Italian guy uh, a couple of, I'd say about two months ago, and he was just telling me, he was saying that... Uh, you know, how he didn't believe in God and how the Jews wanted everybody to believe in their God and they want to take over the world. And uh, and he was saying, you know, the Italians, we were uh, in charge of the Roman Empire and we're coming back. And 
he was going on and on, and I was saying, no, did you? And he was saying, just tell me this. Do you, do you, you, you believe in God? I told him, yeah. He said, you see, the Jews want you to think that because they have brainwashed you. God doesn't exist. And he was, I'll say, about 42, 45. But wh- I said, where are you getting this from? The Jews want to take over the world. He was very militant about it as well. Wow. Well, so that- where is that coming from? It's coming from the pit. It's coming from Satan. It's coming from the father of lies. And I, I mean, this is a new one, though, to say that. I know. But I mean, no, the idea that the Jews want to take over the world, that lie has been around for a while. And I'll tell you exactly where some of it comes from. I'll give you a very specific source for that. But the idea that they, the Jews want everyone to believe in God, and because you believe in God, it's because you've been brainwashed by the Jews. I mean, that, that's a new one. That twist I know they don't hear. So this guy is obviously very lost, very confused, or that the Italians or the Roman Empire are going to come back. He obviously, the very thing he's rejecting is the thing he needs. He needs the God of Israel and the Messiah of Israel, namely Jesus. What a lost soul. May may God help him. Okay, so as far as the lie that the Jews want to take over the world, understand that through history, there have been all kinds of lies spread about the Jewish people. Why? Because God chose them as his people and salvation has come to the world through the Jewish people. And the Jewish people even have a role in salvation and welcoming the Messiah back at the end of the age. So because of that, just like followers of Jesus are targeted by Satan and around the world were persecuted and hated and things like that. Well, the Jewish people are targeted by Satan because of their their role as the chosen people. So through history, Satan has tried to destroy the Jews in various ways. And there are always new lies being told about Israel and the the Jewish people. You know, I'll I'll give you examples from the past. When the Black Plague decimated Europe, Jewish people, because they were were following Torah law and were living in more quarantine settings, they didn't die Mm -hmm. at the same rate that others did. Many died, but it was not as bad because of their, their quarantine laws and things like that. Well, others decided... It must be the reason not as many Jews are dying is because the Jews started the plague and they poisoned the wells. And and because of that, many (laughs) Jews were slaughtered for this. I mean, crazy stuff like that. Or in, I think it was 1215, when the Fourth Lateran Council of the Catholic Church made an official pronouncement that the communion elements were literally the body and blood of Jesus. They literally became the body and blood of Jesus. Then the lie began to circulate. Oh no, Jews can get to Jesus again through the communion elements. And there were Jewish families burned at the stake for allegedly torturing a communion wafer because that was the body of Jesus. So Vicki, I'm talking about crazy, crazy things. The specific lie that the Jews want to take over the world goes back to the protocols of the elders of Zion. This in turn may go back originally to a French novel, just novel, in other words, not history, a novel, make-believe, that then Russian secret police turned into a document and circulated it as a forgery, claiming this, that at a cemetery, there, there was a discussion overheard, someone walking through it overheard a discussion with these Jewish leaders, and it turns out there's a secret cabal, there's a secret group of 300 Jewish people positioned all around the world. Now, this goes back over a century now, all right? And they are waiting for the right moment to take over. And, and, and just, look, just look at social media, people like Mark Zuckerberg, Jewish. They like control the world. Heads of Google, Jewish. Or look at you know, people like Greenspan that were over the, the, the money system in America, Jewish. And, and, and Steven Spielberg and, and, and Hollywood, Jewish. And a leftist... Um, billionaire like George Soros funding so many radical leftist calls. He's a Jew. You see, Jews are trying to take over the world. So the lie then plays in with these other things as opposed to say, wait a second, Jews are less than like one half of 1% of the world population, right? Maybe 13, 14 million Jews out of seven and a half plus billion. And through most of our history, we've been persecuted reject it, hate it, maligned, banished from different countries. But this is the lie goes back 
to the protocols of the elders of Zion, which every few years kind of gets a fresh push and gets circulated again. By the way, it's widely distributed in, in the Muslim world, protocols of the elders of Zion in Arabic translations, widely distributed. And in many parts of the world believed to be gospel true. And anywhere, here are Israel so dominant in the Middle East, you see, there it is, Israel's trying to take over the world. What Israel's trying to do and what the Jewish people are trying to do is survive. And if they can thrive in a country, they are wonderful. But through most of Jewish history, Vicky, the truth be told, it, it looked much more like the Fiddler on the Roof, if you've ever seen that movie, where there was terrible poverty, hardship, displacement. That's what our people have experienced over the years. My book, Christian Antisemitism, Christian Antisemitism, which you can get any different a uh, number of places where you get books. I deal with a lot of the up-to-date lies that are being told about the Jewish people, Christian anti-Semitism. Hey, bless you, Vicky, and glad you're enjoying the information and may God help this gentleman that you spoke with. By the way, just looking at the clock, I'm not gonna have a chance to get to the phones. Justin in Wisconsin, how can a New Testament church celebrate Passover? Actually, if you just go to chosenpeople.com or jewsforjesus.com and type in Passover, they'll have lots of suggestions. You just search Jews for Jesus, Passover, chosen people, Passover. There'll be resources, how you can do this in your church, what you can follow. And Jesse, if you're able to call in tomorrow with your question about why the church has historically believed by and large, that the crucifixion was on Friday, which doesn't seem to give time for three days and three nights in the grave. Great question to call in with tomorrow. Hey, bless you. Have a great day. Let's continue to pray for God's purposes for Israel. Call me a fanatic. It's all right.